Hello and welcome. My name is Father William Maestri, and this is a special edition of Overfed and Undernourished. And you might ask, well, why is this special? Well, I think for two main reasons. Number one, of course, it is the last day of 2020, December 31st. And while many people are going, thank God, you know, maybe the only time they've ever said the word God, but thank God, 2020 is over. Well, on this edition of Overfed and Undernourished, we want to take a bit of a different slant. We want to not simply look at all the uh, challenges and all of the trials and tribulations of 2020, but we also want to look at uh, blessings and good things that took place in 2020. And there were quite a few, many quite significant, not only for the United States, but for the world at large. And it's also a special edition because I'm very glad to welcome back to this particular edition uh, Sharon Fletcher. Sharon, as you know, has uh, served as our uh, executive producer, our technical expert, and uh, all around uh, person who just about does everything for this particular program. And Sharon has been away for a while because I'm happy to report that she has uh, obtained gainful employment. Uh, she's off the rolls of uh, some time employed. That's not true, but anyway. Um, Sharon is now the uh, Director of Player Development for an outstanding uh, golf facility out uh, here, Mission Hills, in Southern California. And uh, in addition to many other duties of teaching and player development and also recruiting, uh, new members and retaining the old, you know, new friends of silver, old friends of gold, care for the new, but treasure the old. And that's uh, very important, uh, not only uh, for golf, but it's also important in our everyday lives to uh, always welcome the new ones of silver, but never forget to treasure the old friends, uh, the ones who have been with us in uh, bright days and blue skies and green lights, and those who have been with us uh, during times of, uh, shall we say, rainy weather and sometimes thunderstorms. So Sharon, it's wonderful to have you back, and I'm so glad that you're here, and uh, glad that uh, you found that uh, wonderful position. I'm sure uh, you're a blessing to uh, many of uh, golfers and uh, would-be golfers uh, <laughs> at uh, Mission Hill. Well, thank you, Father. I, it is. It's, um, it's an incredible blessing, and, uh, and I'm so grateful. So it's definitely one of the top things on my gratitude list. And you still have uh, your investment in uh, Tesla, the, uh, the uh, German Shepherd. Tesla's doing good. Um, she's recovered from motherhood, <laughs> where she had That's 10 right. beautiful pups, and uh, I get to see them, and the owners send me pictures of them, and they're all doing great, and I think we matched the right puppy to the right human, uh, did a good job with that, so lots to be grateful for in this um, difficult year, a lot of people would say. Yes, and I think that that's the right kind of tone, that uh, we don't want to look back in anger, or back in, I'm so glad this is over with, because as uh, St. Augustine said many times, uh, good times, bad times, we are the times. It's what we do with the times. You know, it's not the cards that you're dealt, it's how you play the cards that you're dealt. And uh, everyone gets a bad hand every now and then. But uh, it's how you navigate that. And I Absolutely. think that that's important to be uh, resilient. And if there's anything the American people are, I think it is resilient and hopeful. And that's really the tone we would like to set, uh, not only for today, but also really going forward and looking ahead because we don't simply look back, but we look back to learn and we look forward in hope uh, to do uh, better and to be better. So right on to it, um, what are some of the uh, highlights uh, from your particular standpoint? Let's start with you. Uh, what uh, what stands out for you as one of those uh, important moments that took place in 2020? We don't want the, uh, the litany of all the bad things. I think all of us know that. Uh, we, we don't want another dose of uh, terminal negativity, which is destructive and not constructive. 
So uh, what, uh, what comes to your mind? Well, I think, I mean, first and foremost, what you kind of alluded to, uh, one of the blessings I got was a, a brand new job. And I couldn't, I couldn't write a better job description. And it just, poof, it was there. And um, what a wise person sometimes reminds me of, of uh, St. Augustine, you know, God gives you the boat, but you still got to raise the sail or, or row the boat. And so, uh, you know, I pursued it and um, was down to the final three and then the final two and, and I got the position. And one thing that uh, you inspired me in, and it's going to be three, I was going to have only one New Year's um, goal or aim, maybe not a resolution, we talked about that, but you told me to pray to St. Joseph. And I think I can count on one hand the times I've really prayed for a saint's intercession. I mean, I just had it. And, uh, and I did, and he came through. And uh, so I think that, that that's one of the things, again, that we learned hopefully this year that, that we do need each other. We are a, a people of community. It is not good for man to be alone. Read that somewhere, mm -hmm. can't quite remember where. But, uh, you know, so we have this, whole plenitude of saints in heaven for us and, and they're on our team they're, they're rooting for us they're cheering for us and I haven't used them as much as I'd like to so uh, definitely gonna have Saint Joseph as kind of my, my saint of the year and uh, and look to the saints for inspiration for guidance and yes for intercession so well, and uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, correct me, please, but I think that uh, Pope Francis has named uh, this particular year as uh, dedicated uh, to St. Joseph. That's right. And uh, St. Joseph is uh, the patron of uh, workers, and certainly we want to remember the workers and all of those who have done such a magnificent job. And that's one of the things that came to my mind, uh, not politicians, not big institutional or establishment types, whether religious or secular, but it's the everyday person who went out there, especially in the early part of this uh, virus that uh, in, has infected the world. Um, I'm talking about grocery people, truck drivers, I'm talking about people who, in service stations, and in so many other ways, they kept on keeping on. And they kept us going yeah. in many basic fundamental ways that every day we take for granted. And I think of all those people who every day got up uh, and was facing a great deal of unknown back in March and in April and all of those uh, months in which we knew more about what we didn't know than what we know. And uh, yet they went out there and they fulfilled their duty and to me, those were really anonymous, unsung heroes. But I really believe that the Bible talks about the name of the names of the just, the names of heroes that are written in the book of life. And there's no shelf life for that. They're, they're, they're eternal. And uh, we don't know their names. We don't even see them many, many times. And yet they did so much for us. So I think, you know, in this year of man of the year and woman of the year and all of this other sort of stuff. We look to notoriety. But we also should look to the, uh, the anonymous, uh, the person who uh, worked quietly off camera, the person who works kind of uh, against the wall, and yet they make our life uh, so rich. I think of uh, first responders, uh, and I know uh, many people who left their homes, their families, who were skilled in medicine and in various other essential services, who left and went to the epicenters of this country and some around the world, actually, uh, to help. And this, to me, is a tremendous story of hope and of sacrifice and really of God's presence working through all people not simply the exalted and those who sit in high positions, but it's the everyday person who does so much to hold the world together. 
to hold our lives together. And uh, while we don't give collective uh, awards and recognition and all of this kind of stuff at this time of the year, yet I think that we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to those first responders, our police officers, our, our magnificent police officers who dealt not only with virus but also with violence, terrible violence and destruction that took place. Yet, they were on the line, often criticized, often maligned, rejected, uh, defunded, and all of these kinds of things. Uh, we don't want to defund them. We want to exclaim them and extol them for their, for their hero heroism. Uh, doctors and nurses who work. Uh, that's, that really tells us something about the human spirit and something about the goodness uh, and, and, and the heroism that is within each and every person when that occasion arises. And I, and I really uh, know and believe that God will bless them and their families in abundance, not only here, but uh, in that uh, eternal real world uh, that is to come. Uh, I'd like to bring up something, if I may, which I think uh, is uh, very, very important. Uh, I think that uh, President Trump, now before we get into all of this partisan politics stuff, please, I hope we have not come to the point where peace, peace, and the relieving of the suffering, the hurting, and the dying of humanity becomes a partisan political issue. If that's the case, then uh, we really have miles yet to run because those are not partisan political issues. Uh, if Democrats and Republicans, independents, Paisleys, uh, tree huggers, and everything else cannot get on board, and thank Almighty God for working through human beings to advance peace. And what I'm talking about, of course, is the magnificent Abraham Accords mm -hmm. that President Trump, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, and the leaders, those brave, courageous leaders, and, and Jewish leaders in the, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, and in the Jewish world, they put centuries and centuries, and recently, decades and decades and decades of murder, animosity, distrust, hatred, lost lives, ruined families, loss of prosperity, of quality of life, all of that, all of that, they had a greater courage than going on the battlefield of war. They sought the common ground of peace, the common ground of peace, and that often takes a very, very special, deep kind of courage because it means you have to let all of that baggage, all of those scars, all of those wounds that have been festering for generations and centuries, and you have to seek healing. And that to me was just a magnificent, magnificent sign of hope of what is possible when we give peace a chance when we really give peace a chance based upon trust and mutual respect, then to me, that transcends whether you're blue state, red state, or whatever other color that we happen to be throwing into the mix. This is a question of humanity. And if we cannot rally and come together on that, as I say, we have miles and miles yet to run before we uh, ever take a victory lap. And the great thing is, is that we see more countries mm -hmm. coming together and wanting to be part of this. The old strategy of let's erect the barricades, let's uh, weaponize and get all together. And President Trump, President Trump again said, if you want peace and prosperity and a better life for your family, and for those who will come after you, work with us in the Jewish people, and we can have a better future 
for you and for those who are in the web of time who haven't even appeared yet and yet they will look back and they will say thank God thank God that those people had the courage to seek peace uh, which, which I mean I, I thought it was just a magnificent magnificent achievement in this year of virus and violence peace peace uh, mushroom and blossom and that ought never to be uh, overlooked. No, it was. It was absolutely uh, incredible. And I think what was most incredible is the, the lack of coverage. Uh, some of you may not know what we're talking about. And if you don't, then um, please research it and, and use different sources. Maybe not just the ones that you're comfortable with, because if you haven't heard what we're talking about, the Abraham Accords, uh, something that said couldn't be done, you know, and that that's my take on it. When people say, you know, oh, there'll, there'll never be peace in the Middle East. Well, President Trump didn't accept that. And, uh, you know, we, we hear in the Psalms, sing a new song. And, uh, and I think that was a new song that was sung for the first time. I mean, even the great Ronald Reagan, as great as he was, he couldn't get this done. Every president wanted to have peace. We all want peace. I think in our being, we want, what do we hear? We want, I just want to be happy. Well, peace is happiness. It's a peace that transcends every other emotion, being, state um, of existence is when you have that, that peace that transcends understanding. So it, it, it truly was incredible. It is incredible because it is growing. And, um, you know, much like animosity can be a, a river of tumult and death and destruction, well, peace can also start as a little trickle and then it can grow into a raging river. And that's, I think, what's happening. And the other takeaway I got from that is, and again, I thank President Trump, he doesn't get tunnel vision onto one thing or the problems or this is bad, or I can't do anything else but this one thing, um, or what many people were stuck at doing nothing. Um, he looked elsewhere. You know, what, what can we do right now? And so he went a route that, again, people thought impossible, much like the vaccine, which is, you know, also on my gratitude list. Uh, again, four or five years, the soonest it'll ever be is four to five years. And, and he really, and we've talked about this, and luckily one or two news medias covered it, that uh, I think history will look back and say that, that President Trump has saved more lives than any other human being with lives that would have been lost in the next four to five years, the time that it would have taken to develop this vaccine. And, some people might say, oh, it was the scientist, not Trump. Trump made it possible through the deregulation, getting rid of all the red tape and everything that takes four to five years, having companies, again, much like the Middle East, Bahrain and Israel and U.S. working together, countries that never work together. He got organizations that used to be in competition with each other and would fight against each other, and he got them together to work for a common good. And I think that is... Um, that is a miracle that the modern medicine, it, this vaccine is a, a miracle and it will save millions of lives. I think so. And uh, Operation uh, Warp Speed, yeah. uh, as he called it, uh, that was uh, rained on, uh, rejected uh, right from the beginning as simply another politician's uh, pipe dream. Well, it turned out to be the dream became a reality and not a nightmare. And uh, I think that that's important. Uh, very often, um, we have to take the road less traveled if we're really going to make any kind of advances. And in spite of all of the naysaying, once again, in spite of all of the, you can't, you shouldn't, you won't, uh, don't, uh, 
we have to see things that are possible. Yes, there are risks involved, there's an adventure uh, in, a, in every risk taking, but to do nothing is to do something. It's to become comfortable with destruction and death and suffering of humanity. And it's interesting to note that those who were loudest in their criticism, those who spoke most against it, uh, were one of the first in line to get the shot, to get the vaccine. And that's fine, that's fine. And again, I think of Ronald Reagan, a blessed memory. Ronald Reagan, blessed memory. He had on his desk only one placket on his desk, and it read, there is no limit to the good that one can do if one is not concerned with who gets the credit. And we have to get away from this idea that I did this, I did that, my group did this, my group achieved that, that group did nothing, that group is bad. That gets us nowhere. That gets us further into the darkness. But if we really are concerned, not with who gets the credit, who takes the bows and who gets the Emmys and who gets the Oscars and all of these other sorts of uh, things that have grown in meaninglessness uh, over the last uh, several decades. But we are really concerned about winning a victory for humanity. Winning a victory for humanity. Uh, that's, that's all that matters. Let others take the bow, let others get in front of the camera, get the accolades. That's all fine and good. But it is the lives that are, are, are changed, are touched. And I think, again, of these countless men and women yeah, and who I'm... worked in all of these labs around the clock. We don't even know their name. We know all the people who were in front. We, we, we see them every day. I'm not seeing them in some instances. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, and that's fine. That's fine. You've got to have a face on all of this. I understand that. But I also think of all of those scientists and researchers, those technologists, those nurses and doctors, those volunteers mm -hmm. who came forward and said, I'll go into the test trial. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, that's an enormous story. It's an enormous story of hope and of courage. And it's something that should in inspire us and propel us. Uh, I, I, I'm so tired of the naysayers because they're really zeros. Uh, in some instances, negative integers. I'm interested in the heroes, not zeros. Because with zeros, you have nothing. With heroes, yes, you have risk. Yes, there will be setbacks. But there is an invincible part in us, given by Almighty God, that we will not be defeated. We will not be overcome. That uh, the human spirit is stronger than the obstacles that we face. And I think that these men and women did it. Just a, an extraordinary, extraordinary. There's not enough prizes to go around. There are... Uh... They're the centers. Uh, my dad was a center in the in football, and uh, you know he got smashed every time he lined up. You know we know Drew Brees, but how many people can name his center? The one that snaps him the ball. Yeah. You know, I don't know who the center is. That's right. So you know these uh, these are the the ones that uh, get the job done, but they don't seek the glory. And then even the volunteers, I knew a, a handful of uh, people that they felt like they needed to do something. They actually would sit and sew and make masks. My aunt, who is 90 years old, um, got out her sewing machine and her fabrics, and she started sewing and making masks for people when we didn't have them and they were, you know. And, uh, and then she formed a little group and they all, you know, would do it at their homes, and then their sons or daughters would come, gather them up, we'd set them outside on the porch, and um, everybody can do something, you know, even if it's sewing one mask for That's one right. person, you know, but this was done, I mean, throughout 
our entire great nation. You know, all these people that were doing these little things, whatever possible, go to the store for their neighbor who was afraid or couldn't get to the store and, um, you know, offer a roll of toilet paper to them. Little, little gestures. But uh, yeah, I always think, because my dad used to, you know, sometimes think back and say, you know, yeah, uh, the centers of the world, the ones that just do the job day after day, get beat up and get their face smashed in the mud and um, and never want the glory. They, they're happy for their team. They did their, their part and they don't need, um, you know, offerings and sacrifice, you know, I do not take pride or pleasure in, so. No, I think that that's, uh, I, I think that that's beautiful because what it does is, once again, it comes back to the power of the individual. There's so much that we can do. We, we, we have become, to some extent, addicted to big institutions solving problems. That we've lost the idea that the local and small is beautiful. And it begins with the individual. You know, the iceberg that sunk the Titanic was once a drop of water. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, the beautiful monuments were once a brick. And it is that. It is the it is the loss of powerlessness of, of, of power and the importance of personal individual witness every day. That's the brick and mortar of the edifice of a good society, a good community, a, a good life. Is that one brick, that one person? And uh, I think that that's very important. And again. Cameras won't be rolling. Your name won't be in the newspaper, probably. None of those kinds of things. But it is, it is those small acts of kindness put together that gains critical mass. And it, it, it carries us. It, it becomes a tsunami of good. That's what it does. And that's the kind of tsunami we need. That which washes over the negativity, the hurting, the death, the division, the destruction. And each of us, as you so rightly and powerfully said, you know, each of us from, from toilet paper to can I go and get something for you at the store? Can I check in on you, even if it's a phone call, whatever. Mm -hmm. That sends out a drop, a drop of kindness and a drop of hope. And that, that is a tremendous vaccine that's already available. It's already available. It doesn't have to go through trials. It doesn't have to go through uh, all kinds of certifications. It comes from opening ourselves to God and letting God work through us and to be those vessels of God's everyday presence and goodness. And I think that that's important. Well, this time of the year, uh, Sharon, is also for looking forward. Uh, we look past, and we are thankful for that. Uh, we thank God that we're able to be here, and uh, that you have uh, returned in somewhat uh, MacArthur-like fashion. Uh, you know, I shall return, uh, which I think is a good thing, by the way. Uh, and uh, we often make uh, resolutions this time of the year. Uh, which is a nice thing to do. Uh, it shows that we recognize things that we want to improve on, and that's always good. Uh, the worst thing is to believe that you don't have to improve and you don't have to make resolutions. Then you know you're really in trouble if you believe that. And uh, also it indicates that we have a desire to be better. There is a drive within us to improve and to progress personally and also hopefully for those around us. So, uh, what uh, for this coming 2021 uh, is on your uh, list of uh, to do things? <laughs> to do things. Yes. Well, because of my nice new job, and I actually, I, I really, I didn't even want to say this because um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to admit it, but uh, I think through the year of you know having some months of not doing a whole lot. 
um, tendency for procrastination set in, you know, and uh, so with this job, it's teaching me, you know, you have to get get on it, get it done, um, put priorities, of course, but uh, but to get it done. So that's like number one. It's to to really um, avoid the the tendency to tomorrow. Oh, I'll get it tomorrow, you know, and. Um, and then spiritually, I'll make a shameless little plug. Your book, Daily Renewal in the Holy Spirit. You give great little, I mean, it's a paragraph with a, with a Bible verse. And, um, and oddly enough, today, um, last day of the year, was um, Psalm 34. And, uh, and Psalm 34 says, Depart from evil and do good. And the doing good means that I actually have to raise the sail. I have to row the boat. I have to do something. It implies a, an active participation in me, um, as well as avoiding evil, right? That's also kind of active, I think. Um, but uh, so, yeah, definitely, you know, I. I really am so grateful for this little book. I, it's you know talking about the the word of God and how He speaks to us. He does, and um, and if He doesn't, then you do uh, in this little book. So that uh, that is definitely one uh, one thing that I'm I'm grateful for. I've done it in the years past, and um, I continue to look back and oh, I got that out of that year and this out of this year. But uh, so a little bit of uh, do gooding. And uh, avoiding the procrastination is uh, is what what's on the table for two zero two one. Well, thank you, and thank you for the uh, the, the shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Now, I'll talk to you later about how much this is going to cost me. Because, <laughs> and you know, beware of um, beware of golfers bearing gifts. Uh, you, you never know. Uh, that story has a somewhat different ring to it uh, in ancient times. But nonetheless, <laughs> what I've decided to do, I think, is um, addition by subtraction, if I may uh, use that. Uh, what I've decided to do is to do less and less, uh, frankly, of getting invested and uh, getting involved in looking at uh, a daily dose, perhaps too much, of news and events. Uh, because much of it is um, slanted, much of it is ideological or advocacy, and it's not really reporting, frankly. And at the end of the day, I found myself more and more either aggravated and annoyed, angry, and uh, just walk around with a cloud on my head, or I found myself overly elated with uh, the uh, exuberance etc., which soon we passed into something else. And uh, I, this was doing to me what I wouldn't let others do to me. And uh, I decided that that really was not a good thing. Doesn't mean disengagement uh, from the world, but it means uh, looking at the things that St. Paul says that really matter. Uh, and realizing, and maybe this comes with age since I'm much older than you are, but uh, time is a precious commodity because it's finite, it's limited. You know, the old uh, soap opera, the, the sand through the hourglass, <laughs> such are the days of our lives. Well, it's true. And because it is finite here on earth, eternal in that world to come and in the presence of God. But for right now, it's finite. We have X number of, uh, of days before our ticket's punched. And that's not uh, doom and gloom. Um, the great uh, uh, saint, Saint Benedict, uh, the development of uh, Western monasticism and the Benedictine order. In one of the, if you have time and an inclination, it would be a wonderful thing to set for this coming year. Reading the rule of Saint Benedict, it's one of the most um, common sense approaches, realistic approaches, 
to individual and to community life. And I'm talking about family life, life in business, life in school, what have you. So many of the, the, the real wisdom gems that St. Benedict offers uh, is present there. And you can read a little bit of that every day. And I tell you, it will enrich your life and it will enrich those around you. But Benedict says, keep death ever before you. Now, oh my God, <laughs> I, I, I never want to have anything to do with that. Well, what he meant was, and this is important, is that we, if we keep death before us, we more and more gravitate to and invest ourselves in things that really matter. If you have five dollars, if that's what you have, that's your bankroll, and your bankroll is five dollars, you're going to be very careful, normally, uh, if you're any kind of decent person, you are going to be very careful where you spend your five dollars because it's quite limited. You may have a lot of wants, but what is going to claim part of your five dollars? Now, if you own the printing press, or if you're independently wealthy, uh, you don't go through those things because there's always more coming in and you probably can't spend all you have. So that isn't a concern. But with time, time is that $5 bill and you have to ask yourself where you're going to spend it. And so I think that what I want to do is to really look at priority especially since I have more years in back of me than I have in front of me. Never mind, Sharon. Uh, Sharon's over here wanting to say how many and so on and so forth like that. That will be censored, by the way, uh, in an age of censorship. Um, and, uh, but, but, but I think that uh, the more we come up against that, it's not doom and gloom. It's a kind of aging that helps us to realize what is really important? Is this thing that I'm so ex so angry over or so excited about, is that really something that I want to invest myself and my energy and all of that in? Uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, uh, he called it learned indifference. Learned indifference. And the great English writer T.S. Eliot prayed, Lord, teach me to care and not to care. Mm. Yes, I care. But it's not an ultimate care. It's not, it's not the thing that's going to consume me. It's not the thing that is going to somehow put my feet on the floor in the morning, and if it doesn't happen, I'm crestfallen for, for weeks on end. It is a kind of perspective. It's a perspective on life. And, um, you know, young people, uh, they're going to live forever, or so they think. Um, and we realize that's not true. We know it intellectually, but we don't know it emotionally and how we live. So that's what I would hope and pray that God would give me the grace to get the right set of priorities in the right way, in the right 